How is everybody? Got some people worshiping from home with us. Why don't you come on in next Sunday and join the party? This is the place to be. So good worshiping with you and, uh, and just sensing the energy that is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, oh, how our souls long for that over the last year, huh? To be able to come together, gather together. Well, first, let me begin by expressing my deep appreciation to the, the Hazel family, Dave, Cheryl, Benji, Tiffany, and Tito and Chuck, their dogs. And uh, I first met Dave, I don't know, 16 or 17 years ago, something like that, uh, when I was a single dad in the darkest season of my life. All right. And Dave was God's lifeline to me in a very lonely and challenging time. I will be forever grateful to the Lord for him and for their family. Uh, right around that time is when I was then hired, is in the way that we met, was I was hired at Salem First Church of the Nazarene as the, up in Salem, Oregon, as the outreach pastor, and Dave was the Christian education pastor, and uh, we just kind of hit it off for whatever reason, just kind of became like brothers, fought like brothers, and uh, uh, all that good stuff, started a ministry, celebrate recovery together, just amazing experiences along the way. I love the Hazel family. I love the Hazel family. You are blessed to have them, and they're blessed to have you. They're blessed to have you. And so it's an honor to be able to come and preach for all of you this morning. I'll tell you what. I'm going to make a promise to you. And here it is. That if you will promise to have me back to preach, I will promise to not feel like I have to tell you everything I know in one sermon. Because if this is it, I don't want to leave any meat on the bone if this is it. But if you'll come back, well, that'll help you know, abbreviate things a, a little bit this morning. Do we have a deal? Yes. All right. We've got ourselves a It was Walter Brueggemann, the great Old Testament scholar, that gave for me the greatest definition of preaching I've ever heard. When he said that the task of the preacher is to bring word from another world. To bring word. What I hope to do in the next few minutes is in some way bring to you word from another world. There is another world, you know. Right? There, there's a, a world that is even more real than this one is. It's a world where God lives, where even now the angels are gathered around the throne as they've been doing for many, many years, declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There is another world where God is seated. Someday I want to go there, don't you? Someday I, I want to be there. I, I want to join in with the song of the angels. I'm not going to sound like the angels, I can promise you that. Right? But someday I want to be able to join in with them. And I, I want to see and sense and feel, what does that feel like to be in a place where God rules and reigns and where everything is as it should be? What is it like to be in a kingdom that has no end, where there's no more tears and there's no more goodbyes? What is that like? But the hope of the gospel that belongs to us is not the hope of just some future day that we can anticipate, although that is true. It's also a present hope that invades us in this present dark age. It's a promise that comes to us from God who sits on his throne in heaven and wants for us to know and understand some deep, deep things. It's a hope that is not just the future, but it invades the present age, and it changes everything in a person's life. Everything. And so today I bring you word from another world. It's a word to those who are here that maybe have given up. It's a word to those that maybe feel stuck in a dark place. It's a word for the churches across America that are trying to pick up the pieces after COVID. 
that whatever circumstance you may find yourself in today, the word is that God knows you, right? That, that he knows where you are. And that he wants to take you from where you are to where it is that he wants you to be. He wants you to move forward in the direction that he wants to walk with you. Out of what might feel like a very dark season in your life. And into the beauty of his light. And the good things that go with the kingdom of God. So I want you to hear the word of the Lord from Colossians chapter 1 this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you're welcome to join there with me. Colossians chapter 1. It's interesting. Colossians chapter 1. Do we have a scripture for you? I'm looking at a screen that says Ephesians chapter 3. But the scripture is Colossians chapter 1. We don't care what that screen says. Turn in your Bible or just listen. Right? There were no Bibles in the first century. A letter came in from the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae. They all gathered around and they listened to what the Apostle Paul was writing to them. Listen to the, hear the word of the Lord. Paul, who probably also had reading glasses. Probably not. I turned 50 last summer. Bear with me. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful church in Christ at Al Cajon. Oh, Colossae, excuse me. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up. By the way, what were those three words? Faith, hope, and love. Paul loves those. It's not just 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right, where we hear it in a wedding. Now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul loves to package those three together. And here we are again. The faith, verse 5, and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Somebody say Amen just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day that we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, knowing, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have in great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. This could be a year-long sermon series. Verse 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he has brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. In whom we, we you and I, have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God, I love that scripture. I get fired up just reading that, that scripture. And as I think about the context of that, the, the writing of the book of Colossians, it was, it's been 30 years since the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And Paul is writing, you can just kind of sense the, the energy, the excitement, right? As he's giving them the report. They don't know what's going on all over the world, but he does on all of his little missionary journeys. And he's reporting to them about the good news of this gospel that is now spreading and is spreading. What began in Jerusalem is just one little faithful gathering like this, then moved off to Asia Minor, then over to Macedonia. There's even a church in downtown Rome right now. You know, Paul would have wanted him to know. And, and as I, you know, hear and think about Paul, there's part of me that wishes I could, like, get in a little time capsule 
and go back and say to the Apostle Paul, my friend, you have no idea what's going to happen. Did you know there's going to come a day, right, when when people are going to gather to worship this risen Savior in Orthodox churches in downtown Moscow, Russia, to underground churches in China and bamboo forests as they're kind of hiding away in secrecy, but their allegiance is true. Just this last Easter, I have a Navy, Navy chaplain buddy on an aircraft carrier who posted pictures on Facebook of their worship service out in the middle of you know, where I can't tell you, there, there they all are. And there's the pictures of just sailor after sailor lining up to be baptized while on deployment. Come on now. The, 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 gospel, the gospel is still spreading. Right? That, that God is still on the move. But what stands out to me in, that, in these verses is the very last sentence that God's word tells us what this is all about. And what this is all about is his desire to rescue people from the dominion of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of, the, of his son that he loves, right? That this is a rescue, that some of your translations might say that he is out to deliver, to rescue, to deliver. I did my homework just for you guys. That little Greek word in other places, interestingly enough, is translated dragged. In the, in the first century, you know, in, in the great culture. It's, in other words, and anybody here that has ever been, you know, gone through a boot camp, anybody here ever gone through military kind of training? You, you know, appreciate that. You know that in any sort of military training, they train you how to, like, drag somebody to safety. I mean, there's the, like, grab them by the shoulders, you know, drag them out way to safety. There's the grab them by the belt and, like, you know, drag them to safety. There's the throw them over your shoulder and take them out. Or there's the grab them by the arm, wrap it around your shoulder and kind of carry it out. Whatever the cause, whatever the, the way, whatever way, it doesn't matter. But the mission that we are on in that moment is that I am going to rescue you from the hands of the enemy. And I'm going to carry you to safety, my friend. And this is what the scripture, this is the picture, that this is the, the, what, what the scripture is saying, that, that God has done for us in Christ. That he has come, that you understand that he has rescued you. He has delivered you, right? He has dragged you out of the dominion of darkness and rescued us from the hands of the enemy. And he has saved us and he has brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. That, that, is how God views people. Interestingly enough, right? That, and, and that is why he still loves people that other people have given up on. It's because God sees people as captives in need of liberation. He, he sees us in spiritual chains that we do not have the power to break free from on our own. And so he has sent his son, as the Bible says, to set the captive free. He has sent a Messiah who will then assault enemy strongholds in our world, in our families, within us, that have long since been dominated by the enemy. It was several years ago that I did a a uh, funeral for a World War II Navy veteran who his family told me that on D-Day, he was on one of the ships that was dropping off soldiers on Omaha Beach. His, uh, his family told me that actually in the span of the next month or a month, month and a half, his ship alone made like 30 trips back and forth across the English Channel. Soldiers, supplies, dead and the wounded, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. When, when the family was telling me the story, I couldn't help but to wonder if maybe that gentleman might have crossed paths with my grandpa, who on D-Day, as part of the first division, the big red division, right, for the, for the United States Army, was on one of those ships that was then deposited on Omaha Beach and took the beachhead. I tell sailors, you know, to this day, all the time, that it, was, that it was because of that generation and their sacrifice that there's not a Nazi flag flying outside somewhere. Right? That they liberated 
this world from one of the world's worst tyrants, Hitler, that has ever been on this planet, securing our freedom. And so I tell him, guess what? Now it's your turn to secure our freedoms, right? But I think about my grandfather, my, my son, who then went into the army. Uh, two older ones, two younger, two younger kids. My son, who, you know, who then went into the army. You know, I, I, my, my mom gave to him my grandpa's little pocket Bible that he carried with him throughout World War II. And stuffed in the little Bible was also a letter that he had written to my grandmother as, as well. I mean, it's a very precious thing, you know, to all of us. But I think about him, and I think about those men, and I think about taking that beachhead and assaulting the stronghold of, of the enemy that they then had to assault. And I think about the new world that they then left behind, liberated and free. And as proud as I am of my grandpa, what this story is telling us is that that is just a glimpse, a, a, a little taste of the story of our good and loving God who on Christmas morning put boots on the ground, on Christmas morning invaded this planet through his son, right, to begin to push darkness back. The, the prophecies of, of Jesus are all throughout the Old Testament, right, especially the book of Isaiah, where where where. The book of Isaiah foretells this one. For people that are walking in darkness, they will see a great light. That someone will come that will one day liberate God's good creation that is under the dominion of darkness. Of course, one of the greatest you know, scriptures regarding to Jesus along those lines is Isaiah chapter 61. Which, I love this verse. Isaiah 61 says this. Remember these, these words? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, again, a prophecy 600 years before Jesus, that this will be his mission. The Spirit of the Son, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the, the, the year of the Lord's favor. And then if you know that passage, it's just a few verses later, comes this powerful the image of how the Messiah will then empower a, a, this, this restoration to begin to happen in God's good creation, right? Where it's, it's like everything that the enemy ever stole from you or destroyed in life, that God will go to work restoring and rebuilding. And so it says in verse 4, that they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated, and they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. I, I read that and I think to myself, there is this God promising to go on the move, and that this is what love looks like. It's, it's love that is going to work, and it is promising to go into this world and rebuild and restore and, and, and renew. Of course, we know that in Luke chapter 4, 600 years later, Jesus then walks into his hometown synagogue where he's the guest preacher for the morning, much like I am, right? And the Bible says that he is then handed the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolls this thing, finds Isaiah chapter 61 in it, and reads those exact verses. Goes over, sits down, <laughs> And says that today, this promise of God to send this redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, that this, that, that this is now fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, of course, their response to this word of this guy thinking that he's the Messiah, and, and the rest of his sermon was to take him over to the cliff outside of Nazareth where they were going to chuck him over. I'm hoping things go a little better for me this morning. I promise to not claim to be the Messiah, though I am the king of the barbecue, okay? I know, I've got some rivals in here, I'm sure. But listen, here's what God wants us to hear. And what God wants us to be crystal clear on. And that is where our hope comes from. It will not be the self-help section at Barnes & Noble. 
where people find a way to turn their lives around. We're not the Savior in this story. It, it, our, our hope will not be the next ballot that you cast for whatever politician of your choice. God is saying that it is God that is hope. It is a move of God. It is an act of God that rescues people, that moves us from darkness to light. It is Jesus that comes for us, throws our arm over his shoulder as he drags us out of addictions, out of despair, out of darkness, out of the chains of the enemy that we've been in bondage to for far too long. And it is the Holy Spirit that then empowers us to live in a way that we do not have the power to otherwise live in, to live in freedom and experience all the joy that comes with the freedom from the past. I'm here to tell you that you can raise your kids the right way. You can teach them all the things that you're supposed to teach them. Educate. We can educate people in, 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 the, in the faith, right? That's all good and well. We're supposed to do that. But can I just tell you that there is no substitute for an actual encounter with the living God where he does in you and for you what no one and nothing else can. And he can do that in a moment's time if he chooses. Jim Simbola, anybody remember him? Pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. Anybody read Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire back in the day? A amazing book. You know, he said something that I'll never forget once. I was at a conference. He was there like, yeah, we talk about teaching God's word, and we're supposed to, you know, we obviously, you know, uh, you know we're about teaching pastors and that kind of thing. But then he said something I'll never, I'll never forget. He said, but, but don't confuse things. You can't teach life into people. Boom. I remember here, it's like, you cannot teach life into people. That is a move of God. And an act of God where he awakens the human heart. It is an act where God breathes his spirit. Jesus said you must be born in the spirit, right? Where he breathes his spirit into you. And it somehow, in some way, changes the entire motivational structure of your life. That is the power of one encounter where God moves from someone just being to be studied at a Bible study or whatever to someone that you know. From just some God to obey because you're afraid of what might happen if you don't do what God wants you to do, right? To a God that you love and that you don't want to disappoint, as the scripture is saying. that He, Because he is the one that rescued you. He is the one that grabbed your hand when you felt like you were going to go under. I think that this is what the world wants. And this is what the world wants. So it's not just what is true, what belief, your belief versus that belief. But the question is like, is, is this God real? Is all this stuff real? And it is in these personal encounters where the belief moves from the head down to the heart. I, I grew up in church. I was baptized as a baby. At the age of 12, I was confirmed in, in, in the Lutheran church. Right? I, I believed, I remember going through catechism, confirmation. I believed all the things I was supposed to believe. But there was no life inside of me. There was no life inside of me. I had to be dragged to church, right, by the belt buckle. You know, I, uh, you know, the, you know, dragged it right. I remember one time my mom came up with this bright idea that we were going to have family devotions. And my brother and I just rolled our eyes, and I think we somehow sabotaged that thing so it was only too, you know, too late. We didn't want to have to endure, you know, my mom's, you know, family devotions. But it was later on in my teenage years, my parents moved on to pastor a couple hours away, that I stayed with friends and asked to stay with friends until I graduated. And it was there that I began to attend this Nazarene church in Warren, Pennsylvania. And I began to notice people at this church, like they were more devoted in their religious practices than the churches that I had grown up in. Right? And I, and I saw them trying to live out this like new way of life, this kingdom way of life. Like, they took this stuff seriously. And with, with them, it's like their yes to Jesus meant a no to some other things. And so as I'm watching all this, as I'm seeing these like two paths come up before me, I found myself feeling conflicted. Because I, like, I saw the beauty of what that path produces and the life that it produces. But I also, like, I want to do what I wanted to do. 
Like, sin's fun a lot of times, right? And, and, so, and so remember in the book of James, it talks about the double-minded man? That was me. It was like, what part of me wanted one of that, but the other part of me wanted to do I was conflicted. It was like this tug of war that was going on inside of me. Remember also the prophet Elijah? This is another great moment. I've, I've been on Mount Carmel where he stood before the nation of Israel, looked out over the entire nation, right? And you remember what he said to him? He said, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? They were double minded. It was like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, they wanted Yahweh, they wanted the one true God, but like on Friday and Saturday, it's not like the gods of culture are kind of fun too. And Elijah stood before the nation and said, how long are you going to waver, waver between, two, between two opinions? If God is going to be your God, then serve him. If it's going to be Baal and all the other gods, then serve, just get off the fence. I was the one on the fence. Until I attended a retreat in, western, in the hills of western Pennsylvania. You, you do know that God knows right where to find you, don't you? He knows where to find you. How to move you from darkness to light. Right? He, he knows where you are and where he wants to be able to take you. He, he, he found a single mom in the book of Genesis by the name of Hagar, rejected and alone. He knew right where to find her. He, he knew where to find Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times. He found this failed follower back at his old fishing grounds on the Sea of Galilee. He restored him. Right? I mean, God knew where to find Jonah on the run, Adam and Eve in the middle of their hiding. God knows where to find you, and he knew where to find me. As the speaker at that retreat was delivering you know, the, the, the message, all I can say is somehow and in some way that I can't describe, it was like the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob pulled up the chair next to me. And in one moment, that was over 30 years ago, in one moment my life changed because it became personal. Jesus was no longer a belief to hold on to, the story of a man who died and rose again a long time ago, but he was now like my Savior and, and my Lord, right? He was the one that came for me to set this captive free and to, and to forgive me of all my sin and something in me, I came alive. I came alive. What my parents had been trying to instill in me for years, God did in one night. When I asked my parents then, that was a fall retreat, I remember that Christmas, I asked them for a Bible. They about fell out of their chair. They said, like, who are you and what have you done with our sin, with our son? That guy that didn't want to do, you know, the family devotions. But I wanted to go to church. I wanted to tell my friends about Christ. The double-mindedness had become a single-minded devotion. Not because I had to, but because I wanted to. Life had been breathed into me. You know, when Pastor Dave asked me to preach, I said, what do you want me to preach on? He said, just talk about it. Whatever comes to your mind, whatever you think about this topic of moving forward. Of moving forward. As a church, this church, like a lot of churches, you're kind of coming out of COVID, which has been brutal on churches across, not just America, but across the world, right? And I began to think to myself, first of all, I thought to myself, I'm glad I'm not a pastor anymore in COVID, but anyway, um, but I began to think, about, well, what is, where will our hope come from? Not just for churches, but for families, for you, for me, like where, is, where, where does hope come from? What, what is it that we need? Where will hope come from for a new day? Whatever that means. And that was when I just began to think and pray about that. In my mind, the Lord took my mind back to spiritual ground zero. Right? Where an explosion was set off. That within 30 short years, a gospel is spreading already. Now, already from here, way, way over there, that something happened that created a forward momentum, a forward direction, right, that could not be explained in any other way. And we know what ground zero was. Acts chapter 2. The giving of the Holy Spirit. 
And, and, and what is so interesting to me about that is that in the first chapter of the verse for the, uh, of, of, of Acts, for those of you who might not know the story, Jesus is about ready to be taken up to heaven, you know, to ascend to go be with the Father, and he gives final instructions to the church. And think about who was out there. These were, most of these people had been listening to his preaching for the last two to three. They knew what was right and what was wrong. They knew all about God. They knew the ways of the kingdom. They knew how to, this was how you prayed. This is how you are supposed to read forward. This is right, all this kind of, But for whatever reason, Jesus saw that what they had was insufficient for the mission that lies ahead. Right? But why is that? It's because you can't teach life. Even the world's greatest teacher. You can't teach life into people. The power to change the world and to help rescue people from the dominion of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of God, going out into our world and tearing down enemy strongholds in people and society and families. You, Jesus wanted to know, you don't have yet what it takes to get that done. This requires a move of God. It just does. And so, it, it, and, and so he's there like, I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go, I want you to lock yourself in the upper room. All of you. And I want you to pray like the future of the world depends on it. Pray like the future of your families, your marriages, your side. Right? Just, just start praying and calling out to the Lord, right? Pray and then wait and see. And that's what they did until God moved. Until he moved. And, and that's why I just think it's like all roads just, whenever you look at like church history the last 2,000 years, all roads keep leading back to that. All, all, all ground zeros, if you will, begin there with a fresh encounter between God and, and a person or a group of people. That is the starting point. Pastor Dave is smart. Your church board has very capable people, intelligence. I'm, all, I'm a fan of that. Strategic plans, I love all of that stuff. But there is no substitute for hunger. Anybody hungry? A hunger, a longing for God. A longing within the soul for the, for the things of God, for a move of God. And so much so that there becomes a willingness to lock yourself in an upper room. To wait and pray and seek th this living God. Th there's, there's no shortcuts. There's no little conference. There's no shortcuts. But, but can I just say that there's also no underestimating what God can do through even one person that has a fresh encounter with him. I, I close with this. One of my heroes uh, was a man by the name of Carl Clendenin. He was the former district superintendent of the Oregon Pacific District. And just, you know, you, you become one of my heroes. If you and I meet, we don't see each other again for the, another year and a half. We, we run into each other randomly in some men's bathroom, and you remember my name. That's, that's hero. But anyways, more importantly, I will never forget the story that Carl told of an encounter that he had with God. There he was overseeing as the district superintendent, overseeing the churches in, in western Oregon. Uh, and, uh, and on this one particular day, he had to drive from Salem, where the district office was, over the Cascade Mountain Range, over to Bend, Oregon, where there is the Bend First Church of the Nazarene for some meetings and all that good stuff. As he tells the story, it was on, it was on his way home that night then that he, you know, carves his way back through the Cascade Mountain Range. And then he, as he, you know, comes over the mountains, he looks out and he's able to see all the city lights of the city of Salem, over 100,000 people. Knowing just up the road a little ways is Portland, Oregon, with all, you know, the city of Portland. And as he began to look at all the lights of Salem, he said that he began to think about all the people and the families and the houses and all that, that was going to, and just how few churches, Nazarene churches there were. And that was when the Lord drew near 
to Carl Clendenin. And what God said to him was hard for him to hear, but he needed to hear it. He said that God simply told him, Carl, you don't love me like your father did. You don't love me like your father did. Carl said it was like a bomb that went off inside his own heart and soul. That I don't know where it happened, but maybe somewhere along the way it had just kind of become a job running churches, maintaining, managing churches, all this stuff. But, but like the love and the fire and the drive, just, you know, maybe it, it wasn't what it once was. And it wasn't what his father had. Carl said that he had to pull over the car. His tears just began to you know, well up and then stream down his face. But I'm telling you, it was that night on the side of a highway leading into Salem, Oregon, that a dream was birthed in one man. It became known as the Oregon Plan, which was this church planting initiative. Some of you are old enough, maybe you can remember that. You know, it was this church planting initiative back in the early 80s where this furious and like frighteningly pace of like planting churches in, in throughout Oregon took place. And what was amazing to me as I listened to Carl tell the story was there I was 20 years after. He had pulled over alongside that road, right? And there I was, 20 years later, pastoring one of those Oregon plan churches in Sandy, Oregon, down not far from the base of Mount Hood. And I began to think about all the people, you know, in my church who had been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God, you know, and, and, and I... And I just remember things that I never knew, that ground zero was one man who had one encounter on the side of a road just outside Salem, where God filled his heart again with a love for God and a love for people and a love for the city in which they live, a, a love like his father had had before him. Can I just say that there is no advancing the mission out there until God moves in here, including my own heart, my own life. And so let me ask you this morning, is anybody hungry? Anybody hungry? Anybody want to see God move in the church in your, in your family, in, in your own heart and in your own life? Anybody here tired of living in bondage to something? And you want to know the joy of the freedom that you hear about? Anybody tired of strongholds in your own family? And you need a divine inv you know, invasion. You need God's boots on the ground in your family because that's the only power that's going to change anything. Today I bring you word. from another world. It's that you are loved by God. You are loved by him. You are not alone. You have not been forgotten. You have not gone too far. You are not beyond his reach or ability to save. He still binds up the brokenhearted. He still sets the captives free. Maybe this afternoon, may, maybe you need to go this afternoon for a drive all by yourself. Or go for a walk down on the beach and just talk to him. Talk to the Lord. Maybe you just want to call out to him from your own seat here this morning. Or from your own living room. He knows just where you are. He knows the dark places in which we find ourselves. But he also extends the invitation to call upon the Lord who saves, redeems, restores, renews, right? He rescues us. He is the one that can drag us out of the darkness into a brand new day. We're going to close by singing a song today. It's called Break Every Chains. I love that song. Maybe the song is going to be your prayer. Lord, would you just break a chain? I'm in bondage, Lord, and I need you to do what only you can do in my life. Maybe this song is going to be your prayer. Maybe 
you're here this morning and you feel like I did when I was at that retreat over 30 years ago, that God was grabbing me by the belt and pulling me up, you know, where it was time to pray. And maybe, Dave, I don't know if you can come up here or if others that will be up here to, to pray with you, I would be honored to pray with you, right? And so if you want to pray, just whatever it is that God is saying to you today, whatever that is, respond, let your heart, whatever your heart hears him saying, say yes. And allow God to do in you, in your family, in our community, what only he can do. Would you just stand with me? I want to pray before we sing. Lord God, we just come before you right now. You are the one that that group of followers in that upper room were calling out upon. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God that loves your people enough that you would send your son into the world to save, to redeem, to rescue, to forgive. And oh God, we just call upon you right now. I pray for those that feel like they are in the grip of despair, those that have given up hope. I ask that truth would invade the lies. And I pray, Lord, that you would infuse them with renewed hope, whatever this circumstance may be. I pray for those that are experiencing depression, that feel in the grips of that. Maybe there's been loss, and and it is a past, Lord, that we've gone through that, that still clings to us so tightly. I pray, Lord, that we would let go of all those things, put them in your strong and capable hands as we move into the future that you have for us. I pray for those that are stuck in sin, stuck in addictions, that you would be the bondage breaker, that you would come and set the captives free, that we might experience this life, fullness of life, that we were intended to live in. Oh, God, have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's sing together from the depths of our heart to the God who rescues and saves us. And there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. Yes. And there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, yeah. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, yeah. And no sufficient sacrifice is so freely given such a price. And brought our redemption, heaven's gates swing wide. There is power, and there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. In the name of Jesus, to break every chain, oh, break every chain, break every chain. There is power, oh, there is power, oh, in the name of Jesus. There is power, oh, in the name of Jesus. There is power, oh, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, to break every chain. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. That was a gift from God. But I, I do not want to leave this place. Father, without 
you speaking to us? And if you have spoken to us, any one of us, I don't want us to leave here without saying yes to him. So if God is speaking to you, maybe the best place for you to be is just come right kneel right here. Or you can come sit in the front row, and we'd love to pray with you that, God, I want a genuine experience of you. Darren's going to sing this one more time. And then we're going to close with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get out of here and get on to the rest of our day. But friends, don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Let's be real with God today. Sing, Darren, would you? I hear the chains falling. And I hear the chains falling. Sing that. I hear. And I hear the chains falling. Yes, we do, Lord. And I hear the chains falling. There is power. And there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Anybody want to just say, Pastor, I, I want you to pray for me. I want to see a move of God work in my life. Is that you? Just lift your hand up. Just lift your hand. I want to see a power of God work in my life. I want to see a power of God work in my life. Yes. Yes. Lord Jesus, all over this room, Lord, I, my hand is up, Father, to say yes to you. I need your move to work in my, I need your spirit to bring a fresh anointing. God, I need your spirit to bring <clears throat> a, a renewed sense of vision and direction, not just for our church, but God, for me. For every person who lifted their hand, that God, you would just flow through us with the power of your spirit, that God, like a wind, would blow over us. And that we would never be the same. And in fact, we would look back in moments like this. We would look back even for some today. Maybe for someone that today you would look back at this day. And say, that was a turning point for me. That's when it kind of began to shift. Or, or it just moved in such a way that I've never been the same. Do that for us, Father. We give ourselves to you. We ask, Father, we beg, we plead in desperation, God, for you to do something unique and specific for us as a church and us as a people. We just long for life. For life. Thank you, Father, for Keith coming and, pray and preaching and given his word, but God, he can't preach good enough to breathe life into us. Only you can do that. And it's only when we say yes to you. So, Lord Jesus, break those chains. Whatever is holding us back, whatever is, is keeping us from taking steps towards you, I pray, God, you would just eliminate those things, push them aside, and give us courage to move forward. And we will move with you. As we finish and close today, 
I'm going to ask Darren just to keep playing and even sing. And, and if you're here today and you say, you know, I've, I lifted my hand, I'm saying yes, and, and I'd love, Pastor, would you pray with me? Pastor Keith, would you pray for me? I, would you, as people begin to head that way, and I hope you can tell someone you love them as you take off today, and thank you for being with us today. But don't leave. If you know God's speaking to you, We'd love to pray with you and pray over you. We'll have other, a couple of other of our leaders up here as well. But you come this way as people go that way, all right? God bless you. Go in the grace and power, transformational power of his spirit. Go in his peace and strength. Look forward to being with you again next week. God bless.